Ladies and gentlemen, the next Warriors Corner will begin in four minutes. If you're here from the last Warriors Corner, please vacate to the left or the right. If you're staying for the next brief, please take your seats. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the sixth Warriors Corner Brief, presented by Brigadier General Christopher Leneve, Commanding General, 7th Army Training Command. Hey, thanks to everybody for showing up today uh, to talk a little bit about Europe and the changes that we've, uh, that we've had over there, uh, really in the last four or five months uh, since General Cavoli uh, took command and then instituted some changes inside the, uh, the organization. So on behalf of General Camboli and the team there at USRO, thanks for coming. What I'm going to talk about today is, is my organization, 7th Army Training Command, and uh, how he has changed the structure of my command in order to focus on the readiness of our units uh, in Europe. So 7th Army Training Command, when I took command uh, in May, was uh, kind of like a trade-off of, uh, of Europe, focused solely on training. Uh, and resourcing uh, across Europe our training events uh, in order for our partners and uh, our brigades to get after their readiness. And what we found uh, was, you know, a brigades answering to a three-star headquarters. And General Cavoli had my job two years ago, uh, a little over two years ago, and uh, while he was there, 
he thought that there was a different power that could be uh, put in place there uh, with the uh, 7th Army Training Command. So what he did is he did a, a mission command restructuring. And that's really what I'm going to talk to you about today. It's the power of this new organization uh, in Europe. We are solely focused on, a, on readiness of the combat brigades. Uh, I own still the, uh, the training center, and I own all the resources for training uh, across Europe, uh, you know, under, under General Cavoli. But at the same time, I'm also focusing those resources for the first time inside a command that owns the resources, a training center, and now the combat brigades. So in June and July, I took full uh, TRA over the 173rd Airborne, the 2nd Cavalry Regiment, 12th Cab, and now the new Fires Brigade that's standing up in Europe. Uh, and this has uh, really created a level of efficiency across this force as we work together to get that the highest level of objective T. So what you have at the panel up top here, we have the commander, second uh, CR, uh, Tom Hofe, and his uh, Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Brown. And then we have the 173rd command team here with uh, Colonel Bartholomew and uh, Sergeant Major Oaks. And they're going to talk uh, a couple uh, uh, pieces of equipment that they are specifically focused on inside their, uni their units uh, for, uh, for readiness and uh, really to get at a couple iterative uh, sessions with uh, our Army on how we can make these pieces of equipment better. So next slide real fast. So what does the power really have? So here's the bottom line. There's a CTC in this organization. So I used to be the COG at JRTC for a couple years. The COG at, at JRTC and NTC is kind of like a factory. We get brigades come in and brigades come out. So every month you get a new brigade there. In 7th Army Training Command, that CTC is a partnered unit underneath our command structure with the combat brigades. So the COG gets to sit in on QTBs to understand the training uh, readiness level they're at and where the brigade commander needs to go to meet uh, the requirements that I've set for them and that General Cavoli has set for them. And it's really streamlined kind of a uh, training readiness focus. The brigades will get uh, really uh, four reps in two years at a CTC. So they'll do a, what we call a ready series, and then they'll do a, uh, a CTC. Uh, so over a two-year period, we really get after building uh, on the uh, repetition uh, and, and really that muscle memory for our soldiers inside the organization. Next slide, please. So what you see right here is one of our, uh, one of our CTC OCTs uh, over top of uh, two CRs there in one of their series exercises. Now these exercises go all the way across Europe. So what we can do is we can take uh, the CTC and put them anywhere. Uh, to do what we call a five-pillar training event, and that's to focus on the readiness of a key aspect of what their wartime mission would be in Europe. I like to call it Objective TE. So Objective TE with a Europe kind of flair and a Europe focus. Next slide. Okay, so inside this organization, we have a cab. We have an airborne unit. We have a striker unit. We now have a fires brigade that's standing up, but we have a world-class op four and a world-class OP4 that has at any, any time our partner nations uh, fighting with it. Uh, so right now uh, we have uh, uh, tanks uh, from our Slovenian partners that stay at the CTC. It's a company of them, so they get uh, a good look at what a potential adversaries' weapons and equipment could look like on a future battlefield. And Jay uh, could talk about that. He just came out of his CTC rotation. He's got the uh, the camouflage off of his face uh, to come here. Next slide, please. Everything we do, though, has a focus on our partners. Uh, what you see here is 2CR uh, soldiers are uh, marching in a formation uh, with a uh, partnered unit at Saber Strike. Saber Strike was a, an exercise all across Europe uh, that stretched our legs and stretched our legs for how we might have to deploy uh, to fight a near peer threat. Next slide. And then each of these organizations has the power to be able to innovate inside their formation based off of where we are and how we can kind of turn things at a CTC and give feedback to our Army on what's working and what's not. And that's what they're going to talk to you today about. Uh, two CR commander is going to talk about the new lethality upgrades that he has inside his formation 
and the 173rd Commander is going to talk to you about communications and some electronic warfare equipment. But these give us an opportunity to test things in an environment with peers, and partners, uh, to, uh, to make our formations better in the European theater. Next slide, please. And then we get to work every single rotation with our partners. Here you see uh, some of our soldiers had an opportunity to, to you know, shoot uh, some different weapon systems with our, with our allies. Uh, 7th ATC has a, about 10 uh, 06 level organizations now underneath it, uh, spread out across Europe. And it's really uh, a new engine uh, for readiness across Europe. And it's something uh, very, very uh, uh, dynamic for a person who's never served in Europe before. This is an incredible time to be there as we truly focus on the readiness of the brigades and uh, the potential uh, threats across the world that we might have to face. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand it over to uh, our second cavalry regiment commander, and he's going to talk to you about some of our upgrades that we're looking at on some of our systems. So Tom? Sir, thank you. So Colonel Tom Hope with the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. we got Command Sergeant Major Brown, our Regimental Sergeant Major, with us today. We're just going to take a few minutes to talk to you about some of the strike lethality upgrades uh, that we're, we're currently participating in. Uh, so really, you know, the, the first picture you see there, that is a striker with the Crows J system. We're going to talk about two systems today. We're going to talk about, talk about the ICVD, or the Infantry Carrier Vehicle Dragoon, which has the 30 millimeter on it. And then we're going to talk about the the ICV with the Crows J system on it. So really, a, a kind of couple of key takeaways you know, from 2CR, just from our perspective, and we're really one of many units, and many organizations across the Army that's getting to test these systems as part of the striker lethality upgrade look by the Army. But we'll kind of provide you with our perspective on this. Uh, you know, one of those first pieces that we're talking about is we, we've been very deliberate in kind of establishing what is our way ahead to validate the systems. So we can help, you know, from, from 2CR perspective, provide a, a, an informed, you know, we can help inform the Army on these systems as they go to make decisions about future fieldings and so forth. And then uh, what's been really great about this is the opportunity from us, for our organization, to provide feedback from the soldier at the lowest level. Next slide, please. So kind of give you the quick history. We started receiving the systems in December of 17. Uh, Sergeant Major Brown and I, we laid out a program of, you know, how would we go about validating the system? So we looked you know, at the individual and crew level. We've conducted two striker gunneries with what you see here. These are brand new ICVDs with that 30 millimeter uh, on top of them. So we've done two striker gunneries. Uh, one of those key things we wanted to see from the gunnery process was, you know, was this an intuitive system? You know, how much time investment did it take to train our soldiers to use this new weapon system on top of a striker? How different is it than the older system, which was the RWS that our soldiers were, were used to? And so we got a, a chance to look at that. And then we kind of thought, well, once we understand that, uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to incorporate this into maneuver. So our next step was to do a, a battalion live fire. So we have a battalion that's been up in Poland and support the EFP mission. And uh, we gave them their set. Each battalion gets 21 of these. Uh, so we gave them their set of ICVDs, did their gunnery. And then we went forward with a, a squadron or battalion live fire to use this in direct support of dismounted maneuver forces uh, attacking the trench during the day and night live fire. And then the third process we're going to do when we get home. So when Sergeant Major Brown and I get back to uh, Grafenvir here in a few days, uh, we're going to take the regiment and go down to Holenfeld's, uh, go to JMRC, 7th AT ATC is facilitating us in this, in this testing process. Uh, they're helping us get some, you know, as you can imagine, there's not a mile set for this, but they're helping us get uh, some mile systems that replicate the 30 millimeter, put it on the vehicle, take it forward, and then what will be interesting for us is we'll have two maneuver battalions in the box. One will have the standard 50 cals Mark 19s that we're all familiar with, if you're familiar with the Striker platform. And then the other will battalion will have 21 of these ICVDs and they'll have 21 of the Crows Js. And what we want to see out of it at the end, the question we're going to ask ourselves is, does it change how we fight the formation? And then does it, from the World Class Op 4 perspective, does it change how a potential adversary uh, potentially fights the formation based on the Striker lethality upgrades? Next slide, please. So, and, and go one more slide, please. Kind of talk you through the process. Uh, the first thing was the, you know, going through the EU process and the gunnery and really getting feedback from the, from the lowest level soldier back to the Army. That system for us has been, you know, going through 7th Army Training Command, working with PM Striker and the Tickham Striker, who's been providing information back to the manufacturer to help make adjustments to the system based on that soldier feedback. So I'm going to turn it over to Sergeant Major Brown and really have him provide some perspective on the uniqueness of getting junior soldiers to participate uh, in the Army's force modernization. Sergeant Major. Thank you, sir. 
It, the amazing thing about this is being the only the only striker brigade combat team in the army to have this this equipment right now to have the opportunity to test this. What's really what's really incredible is uh, walking up to a crew of soldiers, uh, an NCO and two lower enlisted, that have been going through this testing process, and they're essentially the army subject matter expert on this on this platform right now, and seeing the excitement. As, as you ask them about it, and they can tell you anything about the equipment, and their, their excitement and being part of being able to provide bottom-up refinement through the whole testing and development of this weapon system. Thank you, sir. Next slide, please. So this picture here, this is just uh, this is from August. This is in Poland at the BPTA training area, which is where we have one of our battalions. Uh, that's part of the uh, Atlantic Resolve mission. And this is the, the day live fire we conducted. This was the first time we used the 30 millimeter in support of maneuver. So you know, what was pretty unique for us was, you know, what we were looking for was a, a precision fire weapon system. And uh, what, was, what was unique to see is after the gunnery, we went through the same gunnery process we normally go through. So the crews didn't get any additional time in terms of training on the weapon system. We put them through the standard, uh, the standard six gates that we go through in gunnery, six tables. And then once we had those qualified crews, we had them go and, and establish a support by fire uh, in support of one of our infantry companies maneuvering on the trench both day and night. And so what we found is, you know, we did six engagements, three day, three night, and what we found was all six iterations, uh, our crews were 100% putting the first burst uh, of ammunition from this 30 millimeter onto the target. Target being T-72s, dug in uh, turret defilade at 600 meters, uh, both day and night. And so th what this system provides for us is uh, the ability to provide precision, lethal, anti-armor fires in direct support of a dismounted infantry force that's moving to seize an objective, uh, which, is, you know, which is really what we're looking for at, at, you know, from our perspective at 2CR um, in, in support of our force. Next slide, please. Okay, then I'll, I'll just make some comments here about the Crows J before I pass it off to the 173rd. So, you know, we've talked about the, the ICVD. Uh, so every platoon now inside of 2CR uh, you know, the platoons typically have four strikers, so now every platoon has two of the 30 millimeters, and then they have two of these systems. So they still have a 50 cal or a Mark 19, whichever is preferable for that particular mission set, but those other two vehicles now have this javelins on top of the, the weapon system. So we just started this fielding uh, here in the last month, and we did our first live fire last Thursday. So Sergeant Major Brown and I got a chance to go out and watch that live fire. We fired three live javelin rounds uh, from this striker. Those crews, same process, went through the, through the gunnery process, and uh, they were three for three uh, for javelin rounds hitting their targets anywhere from 1,200 out to 1,500 meters. And so that's, that's you know, the, the basis of the lethality upgrade for us at the uh, SBCT level inside our platoons. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to uh, Jay for uh, your portion. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next slide, please. Next. Keep on going until you don't see a striker. There you go. Paratroopers. Hey, uh, I'm the commander of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, Colonel Jay Bartholomew. Uh, privileged to command this great brigade for the last 15 months, and it's been an honor serving in United States Army Europe and under 7th Army Training Command as the focus in, during my tenure since I took command in, in summer of 2017 has been deterring our adversaries and building uh, credible combat readiness. And within this great command, as General Leneve mentioned, we've had uh, the awesome opportunity and flexibility in which we could not only build that readiness through tough realistic training, but also to innovate and to pull in the latest systems from across the Army to do it with the imperative of ensuring we're ready to contest in a multitude of environments. The first I'm going to talk to you about is the electronic environment with both my brigade as well as 2nd Cavalry Regiment have been receiving a great deal of support as we develop our capability. And then the second capability we've also had the honor of working with is the integrated tactical network system, which I'll provide you some feedback on and how it's making, hopefully informing the Army in our future mission command capability. Next slide. So this is a paratrooper with a VROD VMAX system. What we decided to do within the 173rd was to pool our capability, much like uh, many armies across the world have EW companies. Uh, we don't have that within our MTO. We've pooled all of our electronic warriors uh, together, not in uh, the S3 section, but within my military intelligence company, uh, commanded by Captain Bridget Calhoun, incredible uh, officer with great pedigree and experience to, to combine them with the LVI teams and make our combat electronic warfare and intelligence platoon. So we've doubled our capacity and capability. Those three collection teams became six. 
they have the dismounted capability to find, fix, and ultimately finish uh, targets with uh, this dismounted capability. Next slide. And we also fielded the, the Sabre Fury system, which is essentially a Duke 5 uh, with the ability to conduct uh, uh, that spectrum operation as well as attack, as well as the, uh, the, the Ravenclaw system. Both of these uh, are, are mirrored off of the systems that are on striker variants as well. So we're not only learning by executing in a live environment at, at uh, JMRC in Hohenfels. We just finished our, our Title 10 date rotation, as General Lenive just mentioned. Command Sergeant Major Oaks and I are straight out of the box from having gotten to work some of these TTPs with some oversight and evaluation from the Asymmetric Warfare Group, who's helped uh, provide some, some good feedback to us. And over time, an iteration against a near-peer threat, we've been able to determine how to operate in this environment. It's a working progress, uh, and it's hope, we hope it's informing the Army on the way we need to go and contest in this environment. Really, three tasks that I've given this platoon to focus on. One is to find the enemy via signal emitter. Second is the ability to communicate what that signal is uh, to the appropriate level of command, be it the troop commander that it's working with on the ground within our uh, cavalry reconnaissance troop that we've uh, attached these elements to in execution as a vehicle-mounted platform, and, and also to inform our CST and our cryptological team uh, and SEMA team at the brigade level to analyze this, the electronic spectrum, and then finally to determine how to, how to finish it. Do we jam it? Do we uh, place fires on it? We've gotten to execute that in uh, several different exercises over the last year. Next slide. And really, it's ultimately about informing the warfighter on the ground. The, the tactical reconnaissance that our scouts are doing, that this scout platoon leader is doing with map and compass, can be informed in that electronic uh, magnetic spectrum. The more we do this, the more we get to execute this in training, the better we're going to get at it and inform, hopefully, industry and in giving us better capability as well as developing our ability to, to fight against a near peer. Uh, next slide. So that second capability I mentioned is the integrated tactical network system. Uh, our brigade is one of three brigades in the Army that currently has uh, the system. First Brigade, uh, or correction, 1508 out of 3rd Brigade 82nd. Uh, first utilized this in a uh, JRTC rotation roughly a year ago. Second Cavalry Regiment fielded the system, and then this platoon leader shown here fielded this system within a week of physically putting his hands on that end user device. Looks like a Samsung phone. He was leading his platoon in a company live fire and placing a sport by fire. Uh, he is uh, manipulating a, a view not only of himself and his squads on the ground, but also has a Puma feed that's uh, downlinked into it via a wideband antenna that's on his dual capable radio on his left hip. So all of this is very intuitive capability, and it's secure but unclassified in terms of, uh, so it's perishable intelligence that, that is being managed, but it's managed at platoon and squad leader level. Next slide. And the great thing about it, as I mentioned with uh, innovation and the ingenuity of the paratrooper, is that uh, he, he or she has taken these systems that are app-based and essentially determined uh, new and creative ways to use them. So what you see here are Ford Observers. That's a private first class on the left-hand side who's got an LLDR, Ford Observer. He's, uh, they've, they determine a way to connect this system uh, to the end user device, as you see in the handheld position in this Ford Observer team. It provides an observation of what the enemies uh, or what the uh, the Ford observer is seeing, as well as a heads-up display on uh, location of map data, and then from there to another end-user device at the mortar firing point for 120 millimeter mortar, provide essentially another version of digital fires, which is highly challenging for the infantry brigade combat team capability based on the the age of the systems that are out there. The Fire Center of Excellence is working on systems. But we in the United States Army Europe are innovating and using creatively the systems that we're given to try and press, press the tactical edge of the capability we're given. Next slide. And also we're able to use this in a manner that's helping uh, support our, our, uh, our tactical edge as well at the battalion and brigade level. So during this recent um, CTC rotation, we employed the integrated tactical network up to the brigade level. Uh, we had the capability to merge in uh, systems at the brigade level and actually uh, see through uh, ultimately a Windows-based system here. This is my deputy commander uh, with our soft LNO identifying uh, locations on the ground for no fire areas for soft uh, that were in, in position before we executed our joint forceful entry operation. So this is yet another tool that was available to us that we attempted to maximize in a, in a live training environment. 
very challenging uh, to do. Lots of development and lots of work, uh, but the great thing within Europe is we've got the flexibility. Next slide. <clears throat> Next, please. Uh, we've got the flexibility to do that with an uh, array of exercises that we have not only in Hohenfels, but also as we jumped into Poland this past summer, we have a battalion that's going to jump into France here next month, and then we'll jump into Slovenia and Croatia and then into Romania this coming summer. Each exercise developing these capabilities, making them uh, better and ultimately better for the Army. So, uh, gentlemen, I think that's, uh, we've finished up on briefers. We'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Um, so are, are we doing anything in a GPS denied environment yet as far as the training in Europe? Yeah, we are. Uh, so at the CTCs we are. Um, and, and we're doing that across the board at the CTCs. Uh, so, you know, to be able to turn them off and have them work in an analog environment. Uh, so, I mean, our, the way we take a look at our uh, systems are you got to be an expert at both. Analog is always the base. Uh, so that has to be, you know, kept up the speed at the same time as your mission command systems are. So if you get, you know, denied in one area, you can still dominate uh, based off of the systems that you have. And I appreciate the question. Hi, question for uh, General Leneve and anybody else who wants to jump in. As the Army transitions, uh, refocuses on nation state, high intensity conflict, uh, at the training centers and, and in your own unit training, how much uh, of the last 17 years worth of lessons learned in counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, uh, stabil stability uh, operations transfers? How much of that are you internalizing and how much just gets left on the shelf? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. So uh, I said earlier I was the COG at JRTC for a couple of years. Uh, so when we first started the date rotations, um, you know, I, it, the first couple of them, uh, you know, we, we started to see uh, w whatever skills that we might have been lacking, you know, based off of what we've been doing for, you know, 17 years. Um, what I tell you is uh, it's easy to audible, you know, from a high, uh, you know, date environment trained force to a counterinsurgency. It's harder, harder to audible up. Uh, so. Uh, as we're training right now, uh, the focus obviously is on date, but we don't forget the lessons learned. The battlefield changes constantly. So you got to be able to go from, you know, uh, high op tempo, high action, direct uh, engagement, to still doing the same type of engagements that you would do across the battlefield is, that we became very proficient at in counterinsurgency. So what I tell you is, uh, as, we, as we pivot back, and we've done this for a while now, it's been uh, a you know, a couple of years that we've been doing the date uh, rotations at our CTCs. And, and we're starting to see, you know, multiple rotations for a brigade now, so you can start to build that, uh, you know, level of confidence from the, you know, lowest all the way up. That you can't forget what we've been doing. Uh, and, and our soldiers are able to, to integrate that in both environments very well. Uh, and that's what we are hoping to capitalize on every time we do a training event. But that's a great question. Sir, gentlemen, uh, Colonel Dan Whitnam, I'm a uh, Marine infantryman. Um, one of the things we're struggling with as a service. Against you. I um, appreciate that. Um, we're struggling with two things. So one thing right now is we have not designated anybody within the ground combat element to do tactical deception. So there hasn't been an element like uh, the engineers and some of our European partners have been designated to be able to do that piece. Uh, that's the first question. The second one is what are you doing to, uh, to reduce the electromagnetic signature of your units out there? Because uh, as you transmit, you will you'll be killed, as we learned in the Ukraine. Oh, that's that's a great uh, it's a great question. I'll, I'm going to put it off to both brigade commanders, but but we take lessons learned across the globe and put it into our CTCs. So uh, the great thing about being in Europe is uh, you know some of those lessons are close by, and we can feed it directly in uh, into our CTCs. But the other two CTC commanders, uh, you know, put. Uh, the newest things that we're seeing across the globe into the uh, into this the the training events there, so our brigades are, get pushed to almost to the point of failure, so we can learn from that. Um, 
But, uh, you, you know, he just went through the rotation, so I'm going to hand it off to him. He can kind of talk the, the denied environment a little bit. Yes, sir. Yeah, very good question. Uh, something we're very cognizant of, uh, and I'm sure you've had the similar conversations of um, a couple of different ways to look at the electric, uh, that electromagnetic signature. One is uh, attempt to minimize it. So obviously, as we do that, we become more analog. And in doing that, we degrade our capability to utilize our systems. So uh, two years ago, when our brigade went through the rotation, that was the philosophy, low, flat, nothing. But in a nothing environment, that one blip still is something. So then the other philosophy is throw the signature. So where do you, how do you de deceive through throwing signature visual as well as electromagnetic? And, and uh, working through that has been another option. What the integrated tactical network system provides is more of like a hover. So it, it provides, and, and just doing some of the studies on this and what we looked at is that when used properly, when it all is working together, it essentially uh, throws a massive signature that is essentially you're hiding in plain sight. Uh, so now something still we have to work through, but I think any one of those three options is something we have to see. And in that contested environment, which we were just fighting in two weeks ago, we definitely had our, we had our ups and downs of where we had to work through that and actually uh, get, get that feedback and execution. So hope, hopefully that helps. And I would just add to that, so both Jay and I, we, we have the same EW capability between 173rd 2CR and, and, and the ITN. So Jay's just come out of the box, he's provided us with the TTPs. This is some of that power of being in 7th ATC together. We've taken that over the last month. We go in the box this Sunday. Uh, so when Sergeant Major and I get back, we're going to head into our rotation at Holmfelds. One of the things in the EW spectrum we're looking at is, can we see ourselves? So a couple of weeks ago, we ran a command post exercise, and I tasked the EW platoon, platoon to go out and look at the regiment. Show us our picture. What does the regimental talk look like in the, in the EW footprint? What do all the squadron talks look like? What do the FDCs look like? Does, the, does our future adversaries, can they identify that? Can they identify our forces? Obviously location, but can they identify force from our signal? And then the same discussions Jay just described. Do we reduce? Do we deceive? Is it a combination? But clearly, we've got to, you know, work in the EW and the electromagnetic domain has to be part of our war fighting functions and has to be part of our schema maneuver that we to de develop uh, if we're going to, going to be able to defeat future adversaries that clearly understand how to exploit this domain. One other that we always circle back to, and <clears throat> it's definitely something that's a challenge for the Army, but any brigade commander I've talked to over time is uh, the use of HF and the benefits of HF, uh, not only in voice but data, and uh, the benefit of working in, in Europe and in every training opportunity I've been in, our allies uh, speak on HF very well, and we learn a lot from, from operating with them in voice and data. So. That's, that's been something that it's a great benefit of not only training and evaluating each other as, as brigades, but also getting to work with these other allied units that relatively small signature, difficult to influence, uh, a lot of trade craft involved, but uh, moving in the right direction. So I think all good options. Hey, what, what you just described uh, is something that I wrestled with as a lieutenant. How do you protect yourself? And how do you protect your soldiers? So whether it's uh, EW or, you know, back in, you know, a long time ago, light signature that you had in our talks, uh, in, our, in our, heck, whenever I used to lay under a poncho line or worried about, you know, could anybody see me with a red lens flashlight? You know, the ones who are going to figure this out are the sergeant majors and, uh, you know, our non-commissioned officers uh, that are out there. So I'm going to pass it off to Sergeant Major Oaks, who just came out of the box, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, how his soldiers got after uh, moving talks and, and all that stuff across the battlefield. Thank you, sir. Absolutely important that this starts at the, the fundamental soldier and paratrooper discipline level. Uh, the best way we're going to fight in a contested environment when we're denied GPS, denied comms, is the basic soldiering fundamentals. So it's always got to start with that, being able to navigate without the use of a GPS. What's your place plan and communications? When we're building our talks, going back to that fundamental of noise and light discipline, every night I'd walk around the brigade talk with my nods on, grab paratroopers and show them, hey, look at this. Look at the light signature we're giving out. Don't use your red lens in the patrol base. So those fundamentals that applied years ago apply today. Now we're building upon those. And it takes the leaders within the organization who have grown up in the environment and the leaders that are teaching the fundamentals of just basic soldiering 
to build upon that was applicable to noise and light discipline, is applicable to the electromagnetic spectrum. Any other questions? Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Rudan Kanon Suzuki from Japan Grand Defense Force. Um, my question is related to the interoperability. Um, so what is the most biggest um, the issue or biggest challenge to solve to, uh, on your uh, equipment or system to doing the CTC training between uh, any other allies, uh, uh, armies, the units? So. Yeah, so a great question. And, uh, and, and thanks for being here. Um, I, personally, I don't think it's a system. I, I don't think it's a component. I think it's leadership. Uh, do you have the proper leadership at that point uh, in, uh, where you're working with a partner to be able to, to move information from one command to the other for the common goal? So uh, I, I personally don't think it's a systems base. I think it's a training base where our leaders have got to be involved. It's got to be early on talked through. Um, about how we're going to communicate with each other. Um, and, you, and you see it at the lowest levels. Uh, so when we have, you know, companies attached to uh, his formation that are parachuting in with him uh, and that he's maneuvering on, on the battlefield at JMRC, it starts with a fundamental understanding of each other. Kind of goes back to his question, you know, uh, if, you know what, have we, uh, what have we learned from our coin uh, fight and what have we been able to move this over? Well, we've learned that uh, yeah, communication work, working as a, you know, kind of a coalition is incredibly important. Uh, and how do you do that in the beginning? Relationships and leadership matter. Um, so uh, there's not like this one box I would tell you about that that's my you know, critical uh, thing that I have to ensure that works on the battlefield so we can, we can fight together. It's more of, are we talking? Are we communicating with each other? Are we explaining our common goals to each other? Do we know where our decisive points are going to be and how we see the fights? And how can we enable each other for the common goal? Thanks for the question. So we got about 10 more, uh, 10 more minutes. Sure. Uh, with the upgraded armament on the uh, uh, strikers, how has, has this affected your mobility and what was the result of this when you did maneuver type training? Yes, yeah, so, so that's a, it's a great question. We, we, you know, that fundamental question we deal with is how do you balance lethality with protection, mobility, and survivability? So we talked about the lethality upgrade, what that 30 millimeter brings in terms of lethality for the striker as well as the Crows J. The next conversation the striker community is starting to have, and really led by JBLM at Joint Base Lewis McCord, uh, is you know we've got we've looked at lethality. What needs to happen in terms of survivability? So over the last year, the Army's looked at some uh, reactive armor capability for the striker. However, everything we do adds more weight to the system. You know it doesn't matter you know, if you can't get the system where it needs to be on time. So it's that it's that balance. I, a couple things I could tell you about the systems I talked about is that. Uh, that 30 millimeter turret, turret that we've got on there, so that's an unmanned turret. Um, you know, it, it, it's lightweight. We, they, we kept it lightweight enough. The Army asked the manufacturer to keep it light enough that we can still deploy the system. Uh, that, that's still air transportable. Because if you go back to the very you know, foundation of the strike brigade combat team concept was they had to all be able to be moved by a C-130. So we have kept that in mind in terms of you know, kind of continuing to identify the requirements for the lethality upgrades. And we're still looking at that as we look at survivability. I will tell you though, for Sergeant Major Brown and I, um, not everything's a material solution. And just like Sergeant Major Oaks is talking about, you know, we're getting ready to go into a rotation. A lot of this is just about discipline. It's just about some of that, uh, you know, some of us in the crowd are a little bit older. Some of that old school stuff that we used to do back in the late 90s and early 2000 in terms of making sure our soldiers know how to do a deliberate defense. They knew how to do survivability moves. They know how to move it at night. But we think through just good field craft is one of the number one ways we can help, uh, help these vehicles survive, survive and protect our force. Sir, Major, any comments? Sir, does that answer your question? Okay. Load plans aren't that bad either. 
Hey, uh, so on behalf of General Cavoli and uh, Star Major Abernathy standing over there in the corner right there, who uh, really provide a climate of incredible mission command for, uh, for the organizations over in Europe that let us uh, get after innovating inside our formations, get after uh, focusing on readiness and uh, being prepared, uh, prepared for whatever the nation calls. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my command, 7th Army Training Command, and the brigades that are underneath us. And uh, we'll, be, we'll stay after a little bit uh, if you have any questions you want to ask us uh, up front. But on behalf of uh, General Cavoli and Sergeant Major Abernathy, thanks for having us today, and uh, take care.